Hello everybody, out there is a category of cars that you may know as the crossover, but I prefer to call the shoulda bought a Golf, because these are cars bought almost exclusively by people that should have bought a Golf. That is because, as far as I'm concerned, in just about every conceivable way, a crossover is worse than a hatchback. Worse looks, worse handling, worse for space, worse for MPG, worse for everything. In fact, I'm now more or less convinced that the only reason many people buy a car such as that is the inflated sense of self-worth they get by being able to lord it over us peasants. But though it still possesses many fine qualities, my most recent encounter with the newest Golf, the Mark 8, did leave me a little bit frustrated. A few, frankly, baffling design decisions had hampered what I felt was a great package. So if, like many, you're now on the hunt for a Golf alternative and you still want it to be a hatchback, what do you buy? Today, I'm going to be looking at what I think could be a genuine competitor, the new Mazda 3. This, I believe, is the first modern Mazda product I've driven that isn't an MX-5. And I have to say, from the moment it landed on my driveway, I have been very, very impressed with it. It is only a few, quite honestly, stupefying things about this car that may prevent it from dethroning the mighty Golf. But let's begin with some of the good stuff, including the way that it looks, because that surely is the first thing you're going to notice. I have to say, I think this is one of the best looking hatchbacks on sale today. It's fabulous, really rakish, quite a sleek coupe-like profile with shades of Alfa Romeo Brera and, I know you'll think I'm silly here, Ferrari FF. But look at the side, long bonnet, sleek low roof line at the back. It's fabulous, particularly in this vibrant soul red paintwork, an £800 option that to me is well worth it. I love the 18-inch alloys, they look fantastic to my eye, and I was very impressed to see the car also sports a pair of tailpipes, which is an unexpectedly sporty touch. Open the door and the pleasant surprises continue. This is a really rather nice cabin. This may be a mid-level trim car, therefore lacks leather seats and the like, but still, it feels far nicer than I expected. It is also a car absolutely jam-packed with really nice little touches that make you believe there's a genuine attention to detail over at Mazda. From the display here, which at a quick glance appears to be a regular three-dial setup, but in fact has a central display that is all digital. Press a button and you'll get a few different modes for it, disappointingly few, I will say, but it's nice to see nonetheless. Over here, the piece of the dash that you can touch is nice, soft, well padded, the sort of thing you don't even see in many a luxury car now, let alone a 20-something thousand pound hatchback. I must confess to also being rather taken with the indicators. They are LED items all round, but unlike your flashy, showy, silly German nonsense with its firework display, instead you've got a nice, simple, very satisfying pulse, which is echoed on the display here too. I love that, as I do the button in the boot which allows you to lock the car the moment you've closed it, the logical and easy to reach placement of the controls to turn off the start-stop and also all of the ADAS systems, and even the tiniest of things like the fact the start-stop engine switch will only activate once you've got your foot on the clutch, so you know when the engine is ready to be started. I love that sort of stuff. In cabin storage space is also excellent. You've got two cup holders down here behind them, an omnibus tray even here. Over your knee, you've got a little drawer too. Door pockets are a reasonable size. I suppose you get an okay size bottle in here. Sunglasses holder up here. There is a lot of space in this car. It's also a car that gives you a lot of value for money. And to talk you through the different trim levels and what each one gives you, I'm going to hand you over to the far more knowledgeable voiceover JM. The Mazda 3 hatchback range starts at £23,265 on the road. Globally, there are more options, but here in the UK, the current lineup consists of two two wheel drive petrol engines with mild hybrid assistance, and about half a dozen trim options depending on how you count them. The most basic is the SEL and comes with a decent specification, including LED lights, rear parking sensors, a cloth interior, split fold rear seats, aircon, DAB radio, sat nav, Android Auto, and Apple CarPlay. The latter is all controlled via a clean and bright 8.8 inch display, which mercifully is not a touchscreen. It is instead manipulated by a controller between the seats. 
Standard safety equipment includes blind spot alert, lane keep assist, and radar guided cruise control, as well as a color heads up display. Audi don't give you that as standard in the RS6, which costs four times as much, so good on you Mazda. Today's car is the middle of the range Sport Lux, which costs around £2,000 more. That gets you keyless entry, dual zone automatic climate control, front parking sensors to go with the rear, a reversing camera, auto dimming rear view mirror, privacy glass at the back, adaptive LED headlights and some sporty touches like the 18 inch alloys, the LED daytime running lights and in the automatic paddle shifters on the steering wheel. It also gives you a powered tilt and slide sunroof when you specify the higher output Skyactiv X engine. Beyond these, you have the GT Sport and Sport Tech Edition. The car is no quicker or sharper, but the features list gains things like a 12-speaker Bose system, 360-degree parking aid, and a leather interior, available in several colours. The most expensive car in the lineup comes in at just under £31,000 on the road, and the options available beyond that are limited to some extra trim to give the car an even sportier look, metallic paint options, and non-standard leather colours. Even fully loaded, you'd be looking at a car costing around £33,000. This means on a feature-for-feature -feature basis, it compares favourably with a Golf. Remember, VW don't like to give you much as standard, so, equivalently specified, the Mazda will always come out a little bit cheaper. Even better, it also fares well against the venerable Kia Sportage, a great car, but a prime example of the shoulda bought a Golf category. The equivalent Sportage would cost about £5,000 more than the Mazda. And at the other end of the scale, the Sangyong Corando I recently drove does give you a marginally bigger car that is also well specified for the same money as the Mazda 3, but the build quality of the two simply cannot be compared. In short, on paper, the Mazda 3 does very well. Thank you, voiceover JM. Now, one thing he may not have talked about is the powertrain, because that I want to discuss. It's really quite special. On paper, it may not seem like all that much. It's a two litre naturally aspirated petrol engine mated to a six speed manual gearbox. Both of these things are branded as Skyactiv in some way, shape or form. And if I were to criticize Mazda for anything, it would be the fact that they've used that branding a little bit too liberally. The chassis is Skyactiv. The gearbox is Skyactiv. The engine is Skyactiv. But behind this silly, very generic sounding terminology is some genuinely fascinating tech and here I think is the engine that deserves special mention because it's nothing short of a masterpiece two liters naturally aspirated 186 horsepower which is already pretty decent maybe even more impressive though is the torque figure 240 newton meters that's 176 pound foot only a few shy of the Toyota GR86 I drove the other week and that was a car with an engine 20% bigger. The 3 is available with several different engines, but in terms of the petrol range, you have two, both branded Skyactiv. You have the 122 horsepower Skyactiv G, which features cylinder deactivation amongst other things, but this is the E Skyactiv X, and it has something Mazda call spark controlled compression ignition. In other words, to achieve that combination of performance and impressive fuel economy, this car combines technology from both diesel and petrol engines. In your traditional petrol engine, you have your fuel and air, they get squeezed together, a spark ignites the whole lot, it explodes, everything happens. In a diesel engine, the combustion comes courtesy of compression. In other words, they simply squeeze together the diesel and air until it simply ignites of its own free will. I'm sure I'm making a complete hash of explaining this, but I'll try my best. With this engine, during the compression stroke, an amount of fuel is injected into the cylinder. It then is slowly compressed. As it gets close to the point where the fuel would have ignited anyway, another second burst of petrol is injected and then a spark is set off. What that does at the very last moment is create that traditional petrol combustion, but also because the chamber is now so highly compressed, the rest of the fuel air in there will also ignite via compression. The idea here being that more of it burns at the same time, more effectively delivering you more efficient power. And it works. This car on the motorway delivers 49.9 MPG. That is absolutely fantastic. I did some cigarette paper maths the other day. At current electricity prices, 35p a kilowatt hour, give or take, that's what I'm paying at home, to charge an electric car that gives you an average of, say, three and a half miles per kilowatt hour, and it does vary quite wildly, I'd say you're paying about 10 pence per mile. This 
depending on what you're paying for your fuel and everything else, you're going to be paying between 13 and 15p. In percentage terms, that's quite a bit, you know, 30 to 50%. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Because it is. However, if you then work that out over the time you're going to own the car, let's just say a three-year deal, 10,000 miles a year, so 30,000 miles during your ownership, that equates to a cost of just £1,500 more to run this versus an EV. Sure, things could go either way. Electricity could get cheaper, so could petrol, but both could become more expensive, yada, yada, so on and so forth. But the fact is, you just are not going to get another car out there in this class that's a full EV for just 1,500 quid more. The reality is, you're likely going to be paying 10 to 15,000 pounds more. It is a hell of an achievement, this thing. It really is. The other Skyactiv branded elements are perhaps a little bit less noteworthy. This six-speed manual Skyactiv MT is a decent, nice, light, easy-to-use manual gearbox with a fairly precise throw, a nice action that I would say is going to be easy for just about anybody to use. The more curious transmission is the automatic, which Mazda very, very boldly claim combines the best of a CVT, a torque converter auto and a dual clutch. That's, um, that's quite a statement there, Mazda. I have absolutely zero experience with it, but I'm so curious about it, I am going to request my next Mazda press car, if they let me have one, to be so equipped. The one bit that really is quite disappointing is the Skyactiv chassis. In this car, it features even more high-strength steel than before, some 3% more, but it also has changed the way it does suspension. So the previous Generation 3 had a fully independent multi-link rear. This, a more simple torsion beam setup, and that's rather disappointing. The key benefits, really, are that for a manufacturer, it's cheaper to make, and for a customer, it gives you more space. The boot is very generous. You can get lots in there. For your average driver, maybe this was the right choice. But to me, given the focus on detail that Mazda have with just about everything else, I think it's a real shame and goes against their philosophy of continuous improvement. It feels like a step backwards. The ride quality in this car is not terrible, but it's also not quite as sophisticated and controlled as I think it really should be and evidently could have been. You do also need to bear in mind that though the engine statistics are very impressive for a naturally aspirated lump in the last sort of decade, we've become very used to turbocharged ones. So this doesn't deliver anywhere near the amount of torque or power that you would expect at low RPM. If you want to make progress in this, you really do need to use the revs. It is certainly, I would say, quick enough. It doesn't really impress all that much. And you would be forgiven for wondering where exactly they've hidden all of those 186 horses. Very typical Mazda, that. It probably didn't help that I jumped into this out of the GR86 that had another sort of 50 horsepower, about the same amount of torque, and was also a couple hundred kilos lighter. This is some 1,450 kilos, depending on how you have it specified. And you can also have a saloon variant, which is quite nice to see, and is also a very good looking thing. Steering feel is okay, not brilliant. It's electrically assisted and is pretty much in line with most other modern cars. It's a little keener to turn in than I would have expected, and that's quite fun. Another thing that would appeal to the former Brera owner, as would the fact that unlike that car, it can actually get people in the back of this one. However, there are some caveats. On account of that sporty roofline, headroom in the back is quite restricted. Even up front, it's not exactly brilliant. I'm 5'10", but long of torso, and in the back, my head is touching the ceiling. That's dangerous. That's really, really not good, and I'm kind of disappointed by that. It's also phenomenally dark back there. If you have this car specced with the privacy glass, it really, really is quite grim. My camera really struggled. And on that note, visibility really is something of a weakness here. The bonnet is fairly long. You've got some of an idea of where it is. You can see a little bit, but this car is quite a bit bigger than the equivalent Golf by some sort of seven inches or so. And tragically, it doesn't actually have quite as much room inside. This may be the looker, but in terms of packaging, the Golf is still the daddy. That being said, I can certainly live with the bonnet. That really isn't an issue. What is, though, is the rear three quarters. With the passenger seat in its regular position, 
I really can't see much out of that rear window, and that is an oversight. Then, over this shoulder, we've got a little rubber strip here, which is a bit of weather sealing, and this has been making a noise constantly. The entire time I've been driving this car, it's been in my ear going... That being said, I have mucked around with it a little bit, and you can tell this is something that is easy to fix. I don't think it helps that it's been extraordinarily cold lately. It's two degrees today, and this is about the warmest it's been while I've had the car, but that just should not happen. Just modern car, nope shouldn't happen at all. Another moment of madness comes courtesy of the reversing camera. This car has parking sensors front and rear, so it's not really been a big issue. However, where Mazda have chosen to put said reversing camera is quite frankly daft. It sits just above the number plate, in a position where you'd expect to find it on something silly like a McLaren or a Ferrari, but on a mass-produced hatchback like this, why? All that's really being achieved is that after just a few miles of driving in conditions like this, you cannot see a single thing out of it. These things all combine together to somewhat conspire against the Mazda. The rattles, the poor visibility, all that jazz. And when you can tell that so much effort and time has been put into the smallest details on this car, it's a bit frustrating. However, none of this for me makes the Mazda 3 a bad car. In fact, it remains a very, very good one. Just a few points shy of being called excellent. And I'd say there's enough different about it to say it's certainly worth trying if you are considering a Golf. Your GTI customer is almost certain not to be impressed with the firepower on offer here, but for the vast majority of uses, I'd say it works really rather well. And I'm certainly looking forward to getting my teeth sunk into a few more Mazdas. A huge thanks to them for lending me the car, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.